Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably upon me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A recent study from the University of Chicago randomly assigned a group of commuters to talk to the strangers sitting next to them on the train or the bus. Another group was told to commute in silence. The results were remarkable. The people who talked to the strangers next to them reported feeling significantly happier than those who commuted in silence. The lead author of the study, psychologist Nick Epley, says that many of the participants told them that they weren't afraid to talk to strangers, but they were afraid that those strangers would not want to talk to them. Engaging with somebody is a little like having a speed bump at the top of a hill, Epley says. You've got to get over that initial bump, and then after that, it seems to go pretty smoothly. But if you don't get over that first bump, you'll never get started. One of the reasons it's so hard to start conversations with strangers is that most of us have become more comfortable interacting with our electronic devices than with other human beings. After doing this study, Epley actually gave away his smartphone. 
because the results made it so apparent that these devices, which we often use to connect with people we know when we're surrounded by people we don't know, create barriers to the very kind of human connection that makes us happier. These days, it is more than just our electronic devices that create barriers to human connection and happiness. The news these past few weeks has been almost unspeakably depressing. Sexual assault on college campuses, torture condoned and executed by our own government, deep division and grief and anger in the aftermath of fatal encounters between police and unarmed African-American citizens. Back in the 1930s, another time of violence and uncertainty and division, Langston Hughes wrote a poem called Tired, which begins like this. I am so tired of waiting, aren't you? For the world to become good and beautiful and kind. 20 years ago, in September of 1994, Nicholas Hayward Jr. was playing cops and robbers with his friends in a public stairwell of the New York City housing project where he lived. He was playing with a plastic gun that had a bright orange tag at the tip to identify it as a toy. Nevertheless, Nicholas was shot and killed by a police officer who thought the gun was real. He was 13 years old. In the 20 years since his death, his father, Nicholas Hayward Sr., has spent his time protesting and speaking out about innocent people who've been killed by the police. As we know, there has been no shortage of incidents for him to protest. Here in Cleveland, we're still mourning the death of Tamir Rice. Across the state in Dayton, there have been small but growing protests since August when John Crawford III was killed by police in a Walmart where he was holding a BB gun that was sold in the store. Iris Blanchard is one of those protesters. She's 44 years old and remembers the first time she protested racial discrimination back when she was a 16-year-old high school student. There's no way I would have envisioned here in 2015, she says, that we'd be at this moment, in this time, still protesting the same issues. I am so tired of waiting aren't you, for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. And yet in a country where mustering the courage to exchange a few pleasantries with a stranger is described as a speed bump at the top of a hill, how will we ever get to a future where the world is good and beautiful and kind? 2,000 years ago, during the second half of the first century, the world did not feel good and beautiful and kind, and the future looked even worse. Radical Jews had revolted against Rome, and Jerusalem was under siege. Conditions in the city were bad. People were divided over how to deal with the occupying force, support insurgent leaders to fight for their land, or submit to Rome and maintain at least the illusion of security. Everyone was anxious, caught between resentment of heavy-handed soldiers and fear of extremist guerrillas. Many of the small villages had mixed populations, both Jews and Gentiles, and tensions ran high. Neighbors were afraid of one another. Families were divided, brother from sister, father from son. But in the midst of all this division and conflict and uncertainty, one small group refused to choose sides. These were the followers of a Galilean rabbi named Jesus, who was crucified for insurrection decades before. Their claim was that this crucifixion was a symbol of what they called God's good news, a sign that God had intervened in this broken world to secure a future of joy and gladness, hope and peace, beauty and kindness for all. 
During this season of Advent, we've been looking at each of the four Gospels and how they begin to try to figure out what these beginnings have to teach us about our role in the Gospel story. Luke, who was writing for an audience of Jews and Gentiles in those uncertain times at the end of the first century, Luke begins with a story about the future. At the beginning of this story, the future looks dismal for Elizabeth and Zechariah, an elderly couple who could not have children and therefore felt they had no future. But then, suddenly and unexpectedly, something happens to change all of that. Zechariah encounters an angel who tells him something so improbable, so inconceivable, that he is left mute by the encounter. Yesterday, thousands of protesters around the country assembled to protest police violence. Any protest having to do with race relations in our country brings to mind the March on Washington more than 50 years ago. The highlight of that march was Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, but I learned recently that that was not the name of the speech on the day it was given. King had drafted multiple versions of the speech, and a couple of titles he considered were Normalcy, Never Again, and The Normalcy Speech. Hard to imagine it going down in history with that title, but the speech earned its enduring title after he gave it. Because as it turns out, the most famous section was essentially an improvisation. In the middle of King's speech, the gospel singer Mahalia Jackson Jackson, shouted to King from the crowd, tell him about the dream, Martin. Hearing her, King left off his prepared remarks and started preaching. You remember his dreams. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The final dream King shared that day came straight from the prophet Isaiah. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. King's dream wasn't just personal or political, it was biblical and theological. It was a dream that came from experience and hope, but also from a firmly rooted faith in God who over and over again promises and delivers in the most surprising and unexpected ways, a future of hope, a future like the one the angel Gabriel promises to Zechariah, you will have joy and gladness. Luke teaches us that at the beginning, no matter how bleak and barren our future appears, God is preparing for us and for our world a future of joy and gladness, peace and justice, a future of hope. We trust in this promised future even, and perhaps especially, when the world around us appears to be hopelessly mired in violence and division, when we can't imagine anything good and beautiful and kind emerging from our world. Zechariah's first response to this future was disbelief. And let's be honest, I think that's our first response too. Do we really believe God is doing anything new this Christmas? Do we really believe this birth that we celebrate changed the world when we look around and see the same problems as 20 years ago and 50 years ago and 2,000 years ago? Do we really believe there will be a time when divisions based on race and class and power and religion will cease and the world will know peace? For nine months, while his wife's belly grew and the future took shape, Zechariah could not speak. And yet, in his silence, God was at work. I don't know about you, but there are times when I feel 
mute. When I look at the world, when I see the future our own children are poised to inherit, I am at a loss for words. Maybe that's why during this season, we push aside our doubts and fears and uncertainties about the future and instead fill our lives with relentless, noisy activity, buying and decorating, shopping and baking, bargain hunting and caroling. Maybe the reason our culture has turned Christmas into an overflowing banquet of consumption and frantic activity is that we are collectively terrified that the real reason for this holiday has no impact on the world at all, no ability to bring the peace and justice for which we long. We fill these days with noise because we fear if we are silent, we might discover that God is silent too. One evening, the great Russian pianist Ignace Jan Paderewski was scheduled to perform a concert in one of the great concert halls of Europe. In the sophisticated audience was a mother with her nine-year-old son. She'd brought him in hopes that he would be inspired to practice his piano more, never mind that he didn't want to be there. As she talked with her friends, the boy slipped from her side and without much notice climbed the stool, sat down, and put his small fingers on the great keyboard. He began to play chopsticks. The roar of the crowd was hushed by hundreds of frowning faces turned in his direction. An angered audience began calling for him to be removed from the stage. Backstage, Peruski overheard the sounds out front and put together what was happening. He grabbed his coat and rushed on the stage. Without one word of announcement, he stooped over the boy, reached around both sides, and began to improvise a counter melody to harmonize and enhance the tune. As the two of them played together, Paderewski kept whispering in the boy's ear, keep going, don't quit, keep on playing, don't quit, I'm right here, don't quit. When Zechariah's son was born and he regained his voice, this is what he had to say. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. How do we live in a world that looks as though it is never going to be good and beautiful and kind? We do it moment by moment, day by day, note by note no matter how faltering our attempts may be. We start conversations with strangers. We listen to those with whom we disagree. We lift our voices in protest against injustice. And most of all, we exercise radical hope and trust that the promises of God are true. And in this strange season of waiting that is Advent, We sit still and keep quiet long enough to feel God's arms around us and to hear God whisper in our ears, keep going, don't quit. I am right here with you, keep going. Your future, the world's future is in my hands. Amen.